Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Wellness for All webinar, when today we'll be looking at the subject of back to school. Last year, we created our Wellness Charter with our vision of Wellness for All. We know it was created by our employees for our employees. But as individuals, we know that uh, life extends beyond the workplace and that lives of our colleagues, of our friends, our families, for those of us with children, and like myself with grandchildren, they play a big part in our lives and in our well-being as well. And so it's great that in line with our charter and what we say in it about our well-being extending beyond the workplace means that we can have a webinar today that's predominantly about something that affects us outside of work. So what we're looking at today, well, there's no doubt that we've had an unprecedented few months in which the majority of children have been off school. And today we're going to look to have some advice from experts on supporting our children, both emotionally and physically, as they return to school in the next week or two. There's also advice for parents, grandparents, guardians and other child carers who themselves might have anxieties about sending their children or grandchildren or children that they care for as guardians returning to school. I think what's most important to remember though is, whilst we can hear from experts and we can take their advice on board, as parents and grandparents and carers, it's you who know your children best. I've got three little nephews, eight-year-old scallywags, who'll be returning to school next week, and my eight-year-old granddaughter, and each of them have had very different experiences throughout COVID, and their return to school will be different experiences for each of the four of them. Today, we've got two experts with us. Uh, we've got Sandra. Sandra works with Simon from Golden Tree. Sandra is a former teacher and now director at Golden Tree with Simon. After leaving teaching, Sandra worked as a Healthy Schools Improvement Advisor and has worked with children and young people, with parents, carers, teachers and governors from a range of backgrounds. She's also an advisor for a wellbeing award for schools and a mum of two teenagers. We've also got Sue Judge back with us. Sue's a registered nutritional therapist and wellbeing coach. As a business owner, she's got a busy work and family life, but she says she's learned over the years that she needs to look after her health and that to come as a top priority in order to look after her family and others as well. She likes to make sure she does regular exercise, takes time in nature, eats healthily, and has quality time with her family and downtime with her friends. So today we're going to start with Sandra uh, and she's going to go through her presentation. That'll be followed by Sue. And then at the end, we'll have our regular question session where the three of us will be there to help answer any questions that you've got. Morning, Sandra, and welcome. Thank you for agreeing to join us and bringing your expertise, particularly around children's well-being and mental health today. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, thank you to Suez. Today, um, I hope to be able to alleviate some of the, the stresses for you around um, managing your children and their anxiety as they return back to school. And I also hope to provide you with some practical strategies that you can use. So managing their anxieties, there's a lot of information around at the moment and it is ever changing. Just for just the other day, for example, the face masks um, and, and the whole confusion that is potentially surrounding the do, we, do they wear face masks at school, don't they wear face masks at school, it's changing constantly. Um, and as human beings, we don't like uncertainty. It's really difficult for us. Changes cause us to worry. And sometimes that worry comes out as anger. 
So if you if you feel your your children are getting angry, what that's doing is that's masking an underlying fear, and that fear is from the change fear um, because change is scary. So it, we can tend to become stressed by that. A golden tree, we use a four A's approach to stress management. But in relation to the COVID-19 situation, um, two of those A's are not possible, which is to avoid the stress. Well, we can avoid it or to alter it. And we kind of can't alter it either. But the other two, we absolutely can do, which is to accept the situation. It is what it is and to adapt ourselves to that situation and that way we will reduce the levels of stress and anxieties that both ourselves and our youngsters are feeling it's a natural parental instinct to try and protect and understandably you'll do absolutely anything to try and remove the distress that's causing the anxiety for your child or children However, instead of trying to remove um, a really natural emotion, which is, which is quite necessary to keep us safe, the best thing you can do is to teach them how to understand the anxiety and cope with the feelings. So what are their worries? Well, excuse me, this is based on um, some research, recent research from Oxford University. It's the core space research, which is um, COVID-19 support for parents, adolescents and children in epidemics. Um, really, the, what their findings were that parents are very much worried about the practicalities, the safety and the transmission. Of, of the COVID-19 virus. However, they perceive that their children are also worried about this and about the fact that the enjoyable things they used to do, they can't do anymore. The reality is that for children and young people, yes, obviously there's the safety implications in terms of transmission, and the older the youngsters get, the more they are concerned about catching, being asymptomatic, but still passing on the virus to their friends and family. However, that is in the background to the fact that for, for primary age children, generally speaking, their worries are about being away from home because obviously they've been at home for a long time, the vast majority of them. Remember, some ch schools haven't closed and some children have been going into school other than over the last few weeks for what would have been their normal summer holidays. But they are excited. Generally speaking, they are very excited, the, the, the primary age children, to get back. For the secondary age um, youngsters and beyond, their main worry tends to be the academic side of things in terms of the time they've missed in school with their studies. And for all children and young people, it's about keeping it in context. Their worries are the usual, normal, back to school, new school year, worries of transition, new class, new school, new teacher, my friends, new peer group, all of the things that have always already been there. It is a normal body response to feel anxious, and it's, it's really important to remember that. It is a normal emotion. It is also very important to remember not to pass on your anxieties to those youngsters, but to be that positive role model to say, yes, this is anxiety provoking, perhaps more than normal. However, keep it in context and try and keep on keep a lid on that. Just recently, the Children's Commissioner for England has released, um, literally yesterday or the day before, um, a useful guide for supporting children returning to school. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the link on to Suez so that that can be shared with you after this um, webinar. So what can you do to help them? It's really important that you remain calm yourself as much as you can. Try and avoid those worry conversations. Yes, you're going to have them, but try and save them for later, perhaps when the youngsters are in bed or certainly when they're not within earshot. So could you just put a couple of bullet points up for me, please? And the next one, thank you. Reassure your child. And it's really important if they ask you something that you don't know, that you say, I don't know, and admit that we're all in this together. We don't know everything, but I'm going to do my best to keep you safe and that I will try very hard to find out for you. Allow your child to talk about their feelings. That's really important. Listen to what they're saying and validate that it's normal to feel like that. If you feel they are struggling to identify their feelings, you can help them out by saying, I can see that you are feeling, and that might be angry or upset or worried, and give a name to that emotion for them, and then tell them that you understand that. There is new routines to establish, and I know Sue is going to say more on routines, but tell, talk to them about school being different when they go back and reassure them absolutely that the school has got lots and lots of safety systems in place. I absolutely know that schools are going over and above to keep their young people and their staff safe in schools. Handing over a little bit of control can empower them. Um, two options of a choice is, is often enough. That could be, for example, to, to do with food. Um, and again, Sue's going to mention more around that later. Do limit their exposure, especially on social media, because it can be full of unhelpful speculations that can increase their anxieties and their worries. So maybe it's yourself. Limit yourself to watching the news headlines once a day, perhaps, but not having on, on a constant um, watching, keeping your eye on social media because some of the things that come out are just adding to that confusion or um, being very unhelpful. Really importantly is to work with your child's school because all schools will be doing things ever so slightly different because all schools are different. Generally, they've got the same guidance, the same requirements in terms of safety, in terms of COVID. On top of that, they've got all of the usual start of the school year things that they have in place. But talk to your individual child's school because it could be different even within a school for different classes and different bubbles that they've got set up. So don't necessarily rely on somebody you know who also goes to that school or from a different school, but talk to your school. Don't put pressure on yourself. Try and think ahead and plan ahead and be prepared. And I really strongly urge you that if you feel you need further support, do seek it out. And we will be putting some um, useful links at the end of the presentation for if you need a little bit more in terms of support. Don't sit on that. Please do seek that support. OK, I'm going to invite you to have a go at something now um, and to experience a strategy that will be really useful for you to use for yourself and with your uh, members of your family, your the, the children and young people. Um, have a go. Please do join in. It is very experiential. You may not feel the benefits just from me talking you through this now. But do revisit this later. It's like with everything, it gets easier and more effective the more you do this. So we're going to have a go at a very short breath meditation. So I'm going to invite you now to um, just move your position in your chair so you have adopted a really nice dignified posture. 
try and get your feet flat on the floor. And to help you, imagine a string running up from the base of your spine and out of the top of your head. So it's just pulling you slightly upright. It's not stretching you, but you've got a nice dignified posture. And just let your arms and hands rest where they feel comfortable. And now I'm going to advise you to uh, invite you to close your eyes and just listen to my voice as I talk you through this. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath in. And when you take that deep breath in, what I want you to do is just focus your attention and your awareness on the place that you feel your breath into your body. Now, everybody's different. So it could be the tip of your nose, your top lip, around your nostrils, your chest or your abdomen. But wherever you notice your breath enter your body, that's where I'd like you to focus your attention. So please take that deep breath in now. In through your nose and then blow it out through your mouth. And we're just going to repeat that and focus your attention. Breathe in. And release. Now I'd like you to keep the attention focused on the part of your body that your breath enters. But let your breathing return to its own natural rate and flow. But keep your attention focused on the place your breath is entering your body. If it helps, stay in your mind. I'm breathing in and I'm breathing out. But keep your attention focused where your breath is entering your body. If you notice your mind wandering, that's fine. That's what our minds do. Just notice that you've been disturbed by an outside sound or feeling and just guide your attention back to the place your breath is entering your body. You may start to notice the difference in breaths. Each one's unique, it's only here once. Some are short and shallow, some are long and deep. Just stay with your breath for a few more moments. And then I'm going to invite you to take another deep breath in. If you do that now for me, please. Deep breath in through your nose, hold it for a moment, and then release through your mouth. And now gently open your eyes and return back to the room and the space that you're in and give a smile. Thank you. I do hope that you um, joined in with that. I do hope that you found it useful. Um, and I do recommend that you revisit that. Just find a moment that's suitable for you in your day that you can fit in literally two minutes of breath meditation to just calm your mind and press the pause button and be now, because we are very good at being human doings, but we are actually human beings. So it's important that we learn to be in the moment. So I really recommend that you have a go and use that. Okay, what I'd like to do now is I'm going to um, demonstrate a very simple breathing technique that you can use with your youngsters. They've all got a hand with them and this is take five and basically it's five deep breaths. What you need to get them to do is to hold their hand up in front of them and use their finger from the other hand to trace gently round the outline of their hand. And we're going to take five 
deep breaths and that will have the same effect. So we breathe in as we go up. Pause gently and then out. And guide round in. And out. And in. And out. And it is as simple and easy as that. Now, that may not be something new to your child because mindfulness and meditation is something that's really growing in schools. Many school, schools are starting to build this into their um, daily practice. But again, if you use that together, if your child is reluctant to give it a go at first, I'm feeling a little bit anxious. Could you just come and do this with me? Do it together. They will start to feel the benefits and eventually that's something they will start to use themselves inside and outside of school to self-soothe. So when they are feeling anxious, if you've been talking about, I am feeling really anxious at the moment, I'm getting a bit worried, my head feels like it's going to explode, come and do Come and take five with me. They will start to use that to self-soothe for themselves. As well as um, schools doing this themselves more and more, the curriculum is actually changing in schools as of when they go back in, uh, in a week or two's time. The curriculum is changing so that mental health is now a statutory part of the curriculum. So schools are already starting to get geared up for that. Add on top of that the current situation of COVID and schools are very much aware that particularly the first few weeks their curriculum their diet for the youngsters is going to be very much around mental health. Another um, really useful tool that you can use is a glitter jar. Again this may be something that's not used for the youngsters because schools are starting to use these Think of like a, snow, a snowstorm that you shake, that's full of snow. You can get things with glycerin or you could get a jar, empty jar, fill it with glycerin and water and glitter. You could make this together with your youngster. That glitter represents their thoughts and we have thousands and thousands of thoughts flooding around our head all of the time. And so basically it's a really easy technique to say, let's just have a moment of just grounding, settling our thoughts, because they're all frantic, shake the jar, put it in front of them and watch the glitter settle down. That would be in their thoughts, just settling, so they can choose then with the clarity of a focused, settled mind to one by one go through those thoughts that they maybe need to deal with. Our thoughts are very powerful. Um, our thoughts affect the way we feel and that affects our behaviour and that affects our thoughts which affects our behaviour. It goes round. That's the model of CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy or Cognitive Behavioural Thinking. And it's natural and normal that we have negative thoughts. That's what we do. That's what our, our brains are actually hardwired to do. Um, but it's really important that you notice these negative thoughts. Just press the pause button. Oh, notice that's not a helpful thought. I'm going to try and reframe that. Because if we reframe our thoughts, they affect our feelings to be a more positive feeling, more positive behaviour, more positive thoughts. And again, that's a cycle. And that way you can teach and train yourself to become a resilient thinker. And I would just refer you to go back to the resilience webinars that are part of um, the package that Suwas are putting on with Ben and Genj for more information on resilience. I want to kind of end this session with just really, really reinforcing the message to you 
that self-care and self-compassion are not selfish. They're actually essential. When you get on an airplane, if things go wrong, but when they do the safety measures, they tell you to put your own oxygen masks on first. And the reason being, you can't help anybody else if you are struggling yourself. So it's really important that you take time out to look after you as well. Do some of the things, the, the nourishing things that you enjoy doing, be that go for a walk, go for a gym, go to the gym, take the dogs for a walk, do a bit of gardening, do some painting, read a book, have a blah, blah, blah. The list is endless and you will do many of these things, but they are essential and reframe the way you think about those things. It's not, I need to escape, I'm feeling overwhelmed. It's, this is an important thing for me to do, something of every day to keep my mental health and resilience as strong as I can because then you can help your youngsters and other family members to cope with the anxieties they've got. Okay, I hope that some of those messages and some of those strategies have been really helpful for you today. I am going to be around for questions at the end, but now um, Sue is going to pick up this presentation in terms of the nutritional side of things. So thank you very much. It's been lovely to be with you today. Hi, thank you. I'm just going to get that slide up. Thank you, Sandra. Um, that was fantastic. And really what I'm going to do is just um, go over some of Sandra's points there um, and look more at the nutritional side. So one of uh, Sandra's metaphors there, you know, putting your oxygen mask on first, I think is so important. And it's um, something that I use often with my clients to help them to understand that when we look after ourselves, we're better placed to look after others. And often when we become anxious, it's because everything else is, there's an issue there. You know, we haven't got our feet firmly on the ground um, and we're not feeling in control and that raises our anxiety. And as parents, we know that, you know, we can tell our, our kids things a thousand times, but actually what they really pay attention to is how we react, how we coping with things because they learn from us. So today we're going to be looking at the some empowering things that you can do to take control of a situation really where we've got very little control. Um, so hopefully you'll find some tips throughout this and we're going to, both Sandra and myself are going to welcome your questions at the end um, to see how we can help you to help your children and help your families um, to reduce anxiety. So. One of the first things I think is really important is getting back into a routine. Um, the summer holidays, six weeks, it, it seems like, well, when I remember my summer holidays as a child, it seemed to go on forever. So the thought of five months of school, that's a long time. And I know as adults, a lot of adults that I've been speaking to, you know, their routines changed as well. There might be a, a glass of wine or two, uh, creeps in a little bit more often, um, some more late nights because they don't have the commute to work. So now is a really an opportunity for us all to get back into a routine. So if we look at things like um, sleep, clawing back that bedtime routine, um, getting to bed on time and for children, it's for eight to 12 hours they need of sleep a night because that's the time when we rest and repair. That's also time when we're growing. So that's important for them, but it's also important for us. Other things that are important, so get up in the morning and do something. So we've got a few days now, probably a week or so before the kids start back at school. Get them into that routine of getting up, having breakfast, getting dressed and going out. They might not have been going out much um, over the past few months or socialising much. And uh, I'm sure everyone can um, 
remember the first time you went back into a, a supermarket or something in after lockdown that it, actually it was quite weird so start trying to do some of those things whether you've got school uniform to get or you're getting some food or a new lunch box get them involved in that because we're stretching out of that comfort zone and home has become our comfort zone. it's always our comfort zone but actually that comfort zone when we're in it for too long can become quite suffocating so we gradually want to extend that out to that we feel a bit happier about being around more people. So don't skip meals, that's really important. And I would really emphasize, I'm gonna talk about this more in a bit, um, reducing the sugar. So sugar actually feeds anxiety. So if we can reduce that and make our meals more nourishing and wholesome, that's really helpful. Eat dinner at a certain time, so depending on how um, old your children are, between sort of five and seven o'clock is probably about right. We want to allow two to three hours after dinner before we go to bed, so we've properly digested our food. Uh, in the summer months, dinner does come later because it's lighter outside, we can get outside and do more things, so start clawing that back. And then reduce things like screen time. If you've watched any of the webinars, like the one we did on sleep, you'll know that activating using our screens, uh, laptops, mobiles, it actually suppresses the, the release of melatonin, which helps to, us to go to sleep and wind down. So if we're suppressing that, we're making going to bed harder. So that's a really important thing to do. And again, I think, you know, our children learn from us. So it's no good, good saying, well, you can't go on your phone, but I can go on mine. So as a family, get into the habit of putting those mobile phones down after dinner and try and do something else. And that can be quite a challenge. So, um, and the next thing really is um, drinking enough water. Um, again, start to introduce that now uh, getting to the habit of having a glass with you or, or a water bottle that you drink constantly through the day and i think a lot of children have uh, issues with going to the toilet at school so that can be quite a hard one but if we're looking at our immune system being hydrated is really really important so it's something that we want to encourage As a nutritional therapist, I firmly believe that food is our medicine. And if we see food and, and the opportunity to feed ourselves, of which we normally do at least three times a day, as an opportunity to fuel ourselves, not just stave off hunger. So eating well helps our brain function. It supports the healthy immune function and it gives us energy. It also can affect our mood and our sleep. So there's a lot of evidence to show how important nutrition really is now for our well-being. So we'll just talk through a few different aspects of that. Sugar, as I've mentioned, um, this is really the key thing. And when you look at foods that are um, produced and manufactured for children, often they've got a higher sugar content. So something like Petit Falou or the little yogurts are a really good uh, example of that. If you look on the back of the packet, it will say the list of ingredients, it will say carbohydrates, and then it will say of which are sugars. So it will also have per 100 grams and per unit size. Look at the 100 grams because that gives you a percentage of sugar or whatever the the um, ingredient is, look at how much sugar is in there. So four grams is the equivalent of a teaspoon. So with things like yogurt, if you look at a more adult version, I can bet you that the adult version will have less sugar than the child's version. And it will probably be cheaper to buy it in those larger quantities too. 
So start reading your labels, get the kids involved, turn them into sugar police. Because as I say, sugar really does feed anxiety too. And it suppresses your immune system. So that, uh, there is science to show that by consuming things, say maybe a can of Coke or a donut, that suppresses your immune function for up to an hour and a half, two hours after eating that. And at the moment, we're going back into the autumn winter term. We want our immune system to be functioning well. And especially at the moment, we want to equip our children to be as robust and resilient as possible. So by reducing that sugar intake, wherever it's coming from is really important. Ways to do that are increasing our protein intake. So every meal we have, we look to increase the protein. So this can be using things like nuts and seeds. It can be using eggs for breakfast, say. Um, if you're having a, a breakfast cereal, look at what that is. Don't add sugar. Even honey and maple syrup are sugar. Um, but look at things like cinnamon or maybe some berries to sweeten it instead. A lot of the, the school bars or uh, breakfast bars are quite um, popular with teenagers, for instance. But again, look at the ingredients. Um, some schools will have a no nut policy, so that's something to look out for. Because a lot of the nuts, the bars um, or things that are higher protein will contain nuts in them. So that's something to check in. Um, we want to increase the antioxidant um, intake as well. And by doing that, we want to look at eating a rainbow. So with a rainbow of foods, we have different nutrients in there. And in the slide here, you can see lots of different colors. One, it looks appealing, but each color has a different property. Another aspect of this is the bacteria that um, lives in our gut. This is really important, not just for our immune system, but also for our mental health. This is where our serotonin is produced, which is our feel-good hormone and it helps to um, reduce anxiety. So these good bacteria, we want to be looking after them and they love the fiber in our vegetables and fruit. And if you want to look at it in a very simplistic way, the bad guys love sugar. And this actually can be when we're trying to be really good and cut out the sugar, why we get those feelings, those cravings of I need that, I need that, muffin like that coke or bar of chocolate and actually it isn't you needing it it's those bacteria needing it because for them it's life or death so in this slide it just gives you some ideas of where we're going to get that protein from where we're going to get our healthy fats um, and some of the tips to look in what i would really dep depending on on the age of your children engage them in what they're eating, engage them in what they like for dinner. And certainly going back to school, they might be doing more packed lunches. Now is the time to encourage them to get involved. We're going, well, what would you like? Would you like pasta salad? Would you like a wrap? Would you like a sandwich? What else can we put in there that you might like? Um, I know, for instance, my daughter was quite happy to take in a salad and she'd get involved in making that. My son, who's 14, he's not interested. He just wants to eat something really quickly so he can get onto the field and play around with the rugby ball with his mates. So engage them in what they're like and actually what they're going to eat um, so that that lunchbox doesn't come home full. I've listed here a few of the specific nutrients that you might want to look at for really supporting the immune system. So we've looked at reducing sugar, we've looked at increasing protein, we've looked at eating a rainbow of foods, and as you can see, different foods hold different vitamins and different minerals. And these are some of the most important ones when we're looking at immune function. 
So vitamin A, for instance, you'll get these in the, those orange foods, um, things like sweet potato and carrots. The B vitamins, so they're a family of vitamins um, and we get those in whole grains, we get them in um, a lot of meat products um, and legumes and dairy. These are really important for all of us um, and they become very depleted when we're stressed. So getting those, um, that family of, of nutrients is very important. Vitamin C. So at the moment, we've got lots of blackberries around, you know, go and pick those, um, but don't add sugar. So a common thing, apple and blackberry crumble, which is delicious, but use eating apples as well as cooking apples so you don't have to add sugar to that. If you make um, a topping for it, use things like the pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds, which you'll see in the next slide, have got nutrients of their own. And you can add oats into that topping so it's not just refined flour and sugar. By adding cinnamon in, we can actually help to balance our blood sugar levels and add sweetness, but without adding sugar to it. So there are different tweaks that we can make there to our food to make it more nutritious. For those who are a little bit more adventurous, um, the, the hedgerows now are brimming with black elderberries. And there's um, an old, um, remedy called um, elderberry syrup, which you can make. And if you look on the internet, there's lots of um, recipes for that. But black elderberries, they should never eat, be eaten raw, they have to be cooked. So here are the minerals. Zinc is really important for our immune system and brilliant sources of that are seafood and things like pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds really easy to put into your porridge um, or to add to um, salads or just to have as a snack. Other things, uh, selenium is really important. So if you haven't got a nut allergy, uh, Brazil nuts, just three or four Brazil nuts gets your daily quota. So that's really good to add. And then looking at how we actually cook food is important too. Um, Different ways um, of preserving and, and utilizing foods are things like the, um, the fermented foods. So you may not have tried sauerkraut and that might not be something to try with the kids, but things like kefir or kombucha they might like. And that fermented food again is very helpful to that good bacteria in our gut. And vitamin D, although there are traces we can get through our diet, the best way to get that is to get outside in the sun. If you've got it today, um, get out in the sun as much as you can. And ideally, first thing in the morning, when we don't need to put smother ourselves with sunscreen. So we've got quite a short window of time now before the clocks change in October, where we can actually synthesize vitamin D from the sunlight. And then I think and just one more um, vegetable to add that is really good for our immune system for lots of different reasons is mushrooms. So not all kids like mushrooms, but they're really easy to disguise, chop up small and hide. So even your basic butter mushroom is very, very good for your immune system. It contains something called beta-glucans. And um, in uh, Asia and Japan and China, in um, traditional Chinese medicine, um, mushrooms are, are seen as a medicine. And we're starting to see that more, certainly in cancer care, um, treating people with mushrooms. So adding even just, as I say, the normal mushrooms into your diet, again, is supporting your immune system. When we cook, we're looking at um, stir frying, steaming or slow cooking. When we boil them, we tend to lose some of the nutrition there. Um, but slow cooking is great because it keeps everything in there. So um, I think some of the other things, sorry, I'm just changing my slides there. Um, 
is getting into a routine. So getting up, getting out, taking some exercise, even if it's just going for a walk. But if you can take the kids to the park and get them involved in moving about, eating well, see every time that you eat as an opportunity to nourish yourself and fuel your body. Getting enough sleep, vitally important. And I think the thing to remember now is, you know, five months is a long time without school and socialising just within our own bubbles. I remember when my, my daughter started primary school and she was absolutely exhausted for the first couple of weeks. Actually, it's going to be like that again because socialising is exhausting. So giving them the benefit of the doubt there and letting them have their downtime when they get home. My son um, caused a lot of anxiety with me because he played games, um, PS4, et cetera, I thought way too long, but it's his way of getting that downtime and uh, just decompressing for the day. So cut them some slack, even if they're older, socializing and learning, it's gonna be quite challenging for them for the first few weeks. Just a couple of other tips. So um, things like rescue remedy, um, you'll probably see it in a yellow, um, with a yellow wrapper on you and you can get that from Boots. They do pastels and they do um, different sweet type op options and a cream. Again, it can give you, the kids can have that in their bag if they are feeling a bit anxious and just suck one. It's also that feeling that they're doing something to reduce their anxiety can make them feel better. And a technique that I was taught um, with a group of people that suffered from mental health issues was to use the palm of your hand and press your thumb into it quite firmly. So that's something that's quite discreet. You can do without anybody knowing. And I did this with a, a lady who was starting to have a panic attack and it really worked. It helped her to get out of that. One, it gives you something to do and focus on, but two, it really helped her get out of it. So the, apparently the uh, understanding behind is the palm of your hand links to your solar plexus, which is our emotional center. So allowing them to do something like that. Now I'm going to pass back over to Sandra now, who is going to give you some more um, opportunities and tools to look at grounding. Thank you, Sue. Um, thank you. Just another um, really effective uh, grounding technique is to have an object, and that object can be anything. I've, here I've got. Um, a, a, a talking egg which feels lovely it's just a wooden egg painted hand painted wooden egg or even a stone I collected this um, when I went on a break somewhere and it I associate memories of that break with that stone so if your child has got some kind of happy object there are two different ways that you can use this um, just holding and squeezing that happy object can bring about the feelings and take them back to that happy place it's another way to press the pause button they're focusing on the the now albeit memories but it's now it's here and it, it's the physical you know squeezing something very much as sue said to the acupressure point in the palm of your hand linked to the emotional center so that's a really good grounding technique on its own. Another way you can use this is, is to have an object um, and use it to ground using mindfulness techniques, which basically is based on the senses. So while I am holding this, I am thinking, um, what can I see? I'm thinking something I can hear, something I can feel, and that might be the floor beneath my feet something I can smell, something I can touch, I can feel it's hard and it's smooth and it's warm in my hand. It may be that it's something cold in their hand. But if that the object that they have is small, 
It can fit in their bag or their pocket and it can go with them wherever they are. So again, encouraging to do this together with your child and young person. And this is the, the, the grounding technique, the, the using the sensations and, and mindfulness techniques, really good, good particularly for the older um, young people. It's something that rather than the glitter jar, that they, they think isn't losing their street cred, but they can carry that with them. So they will, if they regularly use that with you and get into the, actually, yeah, that works. It doesn't change anything, but it just allows me to ground and settle. And then I can tackle one thing at a time that's ahead of me that's a really useful thing that they will then be able to start to self-soothe with they won't need that prompt from somebody else and it's something that they can carry with them so that's a really useful grounding technique that you can use together and eventually um you can use separately and and the your, the, the children and young people will self-soothe with that so that's just a an, another thing that i thought would be useful for you going um on so if you could just flick on to the the support that was mentioned earlier there are i've, I've listed a few things there in terms of mental health and um, you don't need the capital letters in there but but things like uh, mind which, which is is predominantly adults or older young people um young minds is a really good organization again going on these websites um you'll find loads of information the nhs website in terms of the health side of anxieties the next one there is something i came across which is actually an a, a short e-learning course um, that you can do and, and those things in the bullet point are the the components of that course i suppose if things are getting a little trickier and you're worried in terms of the mental health or mental health issues are starting to arise or there is already an underlying mental health condition which is being exacerbated by the current situation please do use things like the samaritans papyrus is a particularly good um, site for children and young people um, and these have um, adapted the way they work now so that they are more accessible to young people both young minds and papyrus have a text service as well I'm not quite sure whether they've got a live chat, but they certainly have telephone um, chat, but they have a text service where they can, that's the way they communicate. They feel more comfortable communicating that way. They can send a text and they will get a reply. They will get some support, as will you. Um, and also make use of the, the fantastic employee assistance programme that SOAS have. It really is a fantastic EAP that you've got there. So make use of it. Again, that is not for your children and young people. That is for you as a member of staff. But thinking back to what I said of self-care is essential. So if you need support to enable you to support others, then please use that as well. So hopefully you found lots of um, useful information in today's um, presentations. And I'm going to hand back now to Tracy. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, so uh, we extended the time for this webinar this week because we thought there might be lots of questions and we wanted to give uh, Sandra and Sue who will come back on now with our videos to, to answer any questions that you've got. So if you've got questions, do pop those into the question box. We've got some already. Um, so. Um, I'll take a look at those now. See, uh, there's Sue. Let's wait for Sandra. There we go. Okay. Right, we've got some questions already, but as I say, you know, do pop some questions in. We did make this session a little bit longer, so we'd have a good amount of time for to answer any questions that people have got. Um, so I'll just jump in with these, if that's all right. Um, okay, the first one, uh, probably put to you first, Sandra, can pets help reducing anxiety levels? Absolutely. Pets, I mean, there are many things that I didn't mention, but pets and pet therapy, there is more and more research now 
um, going around pet therapy in terms of all it's, it's started off in, in using it as therapy for older people, Alzheimer's patients, things like that. But uh, many, many schools now have school pets in terms of therapy dogs. Um, I've seen them in action. They are specifically trained. A school will have its own dog that has um, free reign of the school. And mm -hmm. I've seen them where they will actually go and seek out and sit next to a child that is feeling anxious. That child will automatically then stroke that pet, interact with that, that with the dog, um, and it reduces their anxiety. And once the dog feels happy that that child has, has kind of come down, if you like, um, they will move on. It is absolutely amazing, but absolutely any pet um, really has a calming influence. And pets as therapy is really growing um, as the research is getting more and more robust around this. So mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, one for Sue, this one on snacks. Um, my children's favourite snacks are nuts. School has a no nut policy. What are comparable alternatives for packed lunches? This will be helpful because my one of my little nephews has got peanut allergy, so better get my pen out and write this one down. <laughs> it, that, yeah, that's really tough, isn't it? Um, so there's a company called Nairns, N-A-I-R-N-S, and they make oat cakes. And that sounds, I know that sounds really boring, but they do flavoured ones. So they do one with um, chocolate chips in it. And they normally come in a little packet, sealed packet of three. So they they can be brilliant for a lunchbox. Um, they're not as sweet. They haven't got as much added sugar in. Um, so I'd look at something like that. Um, you could make your own like little protein balls. They're quite easy to do with um, oats, dates as a sweetener. Um, and then you can flavour them with chocolate or uh, cinnamon. If you go onto Pinterest, there's loads of different recipes on there. And that's quite nice because you can get them involved in making them as well. Uh, or you could make a healthier flapjack, again, without the golden syrup and the molasses. Um, use a little bit, and I mean a little bit of dried fruit in there, but again, the cinnamon that can add sweetness without added sugar as well. There's that... a, uh, someone else who's asked a, a question, another person uh, who's got a, a nut allergy, uh, that's saying, uh, is there an alternative snack um, to nuts that, that gives you protein? So would that have given you protein as well? or? Um, there's The fibre will help to keep, keep you full up. Things like hummus, that can be quite nice. Um, and that's got, so as long as you're okay with sesame seeds, eggs are brilliant. And I know that's a bit of a contentious issue, maybe taking a boiled egg to school because of the smell. Um, but it's, it's looking at a chunk of cheese and an apple. That's quite good because although the apple's sweet, You've got the fibre in it, but a chunk of cheese as well as your protein. So having those two together can be quite nice. OK, one for Sandra. Um, so I've noticed that my nine year old boy has gradually become angry and is misbehaving. Do you think this could be due to anxiety and the situation we are in? Could I use the take five to help with this? Absolutely. Um, as I, I mentioned, um, quite often, more times than not, displays of anger and aggressive behaviour are masking fear. And that fear comes from things changing, things being different, um, and those anxieties. So absolutely, I would say that that's kind of the underlying root cause of it. Um, also, that CBT cycle of our thoughts affecting our feelings, affecting our behaviour. So these automatic negative thoughts that we have, these ants that we all have, affect our feelings and those feelings are therefore the negative feelings, feeling upset, feeling angry, 
which then affect our behavior and are displayed as, as negative behavior. So that reframing thoughts really helps. Um, I'm just going to step up one second because how my shell in terms of the nine year old and younger children, this is Archie, and Archie is our anteater, and he ants, which are automatic negative thoughts. Um, and, and basically, he can kind of eat the ants from the child, from the ear, or from wherever, but he will eat those automatic negative thoughts. The technique of the take five, absolutely, in terms of a grounding thing, but it's about working with the child to say just press the pause button that negative what, what are you thinking right now and how can we turn that around so instead of i can't do this perhaps it could be how can we make that that's stopping us that's a red light a red thought how can we make that into a green thought and it may be this is difficult but i'm going to keep trying and it's mm. just ever so slightly altering that automatic negative thought into from, from red and something that's been a stop and a blocker to something that potentially is green and a bit more positive. So mm -hmm. it's noticing those, those negative thoughts that we have, trying to reframe them and look at um, ways that we can then move forward and using that take five for the breathing absolute and, and the the glitter jar as well in terms of we have all of these thoughts and we all do it's normal it's natural but let's just let our thoughts settle the reason i say glitter jar is because it's visual because trying to visualize your mind and thoughts is really difficult particularly for youngsters mm -hmm. um even as adults that's difficult so if you've got something visual i can see my thoughts that is that is my head it's settling down my thoughts are settling down that allows me some clarity of mind. So I can mm. now think, right, which one am I going to talk about now? And can you help me work through this? Mm. Mm. I think that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, another nutrition one. Uh, my son loves Marmite. Uh, we all love it or hate it, don't we? <laughs> Uh, and wants to have it on toast every morning. I don't think there's much sugar in it. So is this a healthy choice? Uh, Marmite's a lot better than uh, marmalade or jam. Um, and there are, you could say there are some B vitamins in Marmite. It would be healthier if you had uh, something of protein with it. Um, so an egg, or um, even a piece of cheese actually um, to go with it to give you that protein. So one slice of bread can be the equivalent of three teaspoons of sugar. So we don't tend to think of it as a refined carbohydrate, but it is. So adding some protein in there in some shape or form would be great. Okay, didn't know that about bread having so much uh, sugar in it. Um, okay, another nutrition uh, uh, question. My daughter is seven, doesn't like to eat breakfast, so when it's term time and we're in a rush in the morning, I usually end up resorting to a quick sugary breakfast, just so I know she's had something uh, before school. What would be a good alternative to things like breakfast bars or brioche? other than getting up earlier, which she also doesn't like because she's a night <laughs> owl. <laughs> um, so what I'd really recommend you to do is start looking at the labels. So a lot of the breakfast bars, they are sweeter. They've got things like golden syrup in them and, and they're going for that sort of sweet tooth and, and brioche as well. If you have a look at some of the different, there's nature bars that are oats, um, and then if, again, if they've got some nuts in them, if you're eating them on the way to school, you should be fine unless you've got an allergy. That's going to add your protein. But look at look at the labels. Um, I wouldn't really advise having anything with chocolate in the morning. Um, we don't really want to encourage that habit. Um, but look at look at those sort of things or if it's you know, eating in the car on the way 
to school, for instance, um, if you've got time yourself to make it, something like French toast or eggy bread can be good that they can, again, be eating on the way. Mm. OK, thanks, Sue. Uh, another one. Uh, my kids love eating bananas, uh, which she uh, finds uh, great. I'm not sure I'm assuming it's mum. It could be quite easily dad. Uh, but sometimes I feel they eat too many of them each day. Are there any negative effects to health due to eating too many bananas? Um, not so much for kids. I mean, they're high in potassium. So if you had a potassium sodium issue, it's normally someone older with heart condition might have that. Um, uh, and if they're on drugs, it can affect that. The thing to remember is, as you know, like a green banana or one that's just going yellow, it's not so sweet. But those ones with all the brown spots, they're actually really sweet. And again, they can be the equivalent of three teaspoons of sugar quite easily. So it's, it's not that a banana does have sugar in it, but going back to the bread, it's the conversion of those starches into glucose and obviously glucose is a sugar so again with your banana one or two a day as a child would be okay but best to have with maybe a few brazil nuts or some almonds because you've got that protein element balances the blood sugar mm -hmm. okay gosh i've got an auntie she's not with us anymore who used to love bananas and she would only eat them when they were fully brown you know, uh, I like them a bit harder. Um, so she's obviously eating a lot of sugar, my auntie Jo. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, okay. Um, just another question for, for you, Sandra. Um, I uh, feel a little bit anxious about my children going back to school, but they seem to be okay and, and not saying anything much about it should i be bringing up the question of going back to school or, or or should i just leave it as i said right at the beginning parents are perceiving that children have the same anxieties of, the, of them and the reality is that actually they are excited to get back they've had a long time off school yes things are going to be different um and and children are find it easier to adapt to that change, that accept and adapt stress management keywords that I mentioned. Um, it tends to be easier for youngsters to just go with the flow it, and, and have the mindset of it is what it is and I'll make the best of it. But actually we've been off now for, for so long, they are excited to get back. Um, I, I know my, my niece, um, they are very different. My son and my niece both just enrolled in, in sixth form college this week for, for A-level study and found that they've got an extra week to wait yet to what they thought they had. Uh, my niece was absolutely devastated because she's desperate to get back. Uh, my son was a bit disappointed, but I think he just thought, well, I've got an extra week where I can play on my games. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so really, um, it's about if it's your anxieties, then try and keep them to you mm. and try and do some strategies yourself to help alleviate your anxiety mm. but actually yeah try not to, to be that positive role model they learn by what they see you do so what mm. we don't want to do is if they are excited and not feeling particularly anxious is to put them into that place yeah because if not it's um just because they're not feeling anxious about it doesn't mean they're not still thinking about keeping safe because they will. The schools have got things in place and they will be just going with the flow. It's not that they're going to be being flippant, careless and putting themselves at risk. Mm. That, that won't, won't happen. They will just be excited, but they will still be keeping safe. Mm. So it's very much that the adult anxiety and it's working through that yourself. Mm. Okay. Um, Sandra, uh, you mentioned uh, that mental health will be part of the national curriculum. Have you are you able to share, you know, what some of that might look like? Uh, what what um, form that would take? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
to give the acronyms in terms of school speak, but PSHE, Personal, Social, Health and Economic Education, has been part of the curriculum for many, many years, um, but a non-statutory part of the curriculum. So for well over 20 years now, um, I've been banging the drum as a, as a teacher and as an advisor um, to make it a, a statutory part of the curriculum, a compulsory part of the curriculum, because schools are busy. Um, and so if something's going to slip from a Friday afternoon's timetable, that would be the thing to go because we don't have to do it. Actually, what the um, government have now done is from that massively broad curriculum of all that personal, social, health and economic education, they have pulled out the strands of um, what was called sex and relationship education. They've renamed it, it's relationship and sex education. Relationship education in primary schools, relationship and sex education in secondary schools, and also the mental health element. And they are now a statutory subject on the curriculum from September 2020. Mm -hmm. Because of what that, that had gone through pre COVID. Yeah. Because of COVID, they have loosened slightly the requirement that schools have got this in place from hitting the ground in September. Mm. And they've said as long as it's being done by the end of this academic year, that's fine, rather mm. than it's got to be good to go in September because schools have got other things to deal with. And I think mm. that's fair. Yeah. But I absolutely, you know, massively raised a cheer when I found out that the RE or RSE and health education, which includes um, basic physical first aid it include, and, and physical health and healthy eating, it includes mental health as well. And now a statutory part of the curriculum that has got to be timetabled and taught explicitly to the children as a discrete subject. The very nature of it means it bleeds across many subjects and that is the best way for it to be delivered but also that the children will know, yes, this is, we are having lessons on mental health, mm. as well as them being encouraged to use what they've learned every day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, just, you know, personally, I think that's a, you know, a, a really positive step forward. We know how many, you know, young people, um, excuse me, don't know who that is. Um, how many young people struggle uh, but when we also know that we can learn you know personal resilience so the sooner that we can start to develop those skills the better absolutely yeah. and that many mental health um issues and mental health conditions start in childhood hmm. so the sooner i'm very passionate about doing that preventative protect we all have mental health all of the time and the yeah. more you can do to protect that mental health and keep it robust and resilient, the better things will be. And that will reduce the number of mental health, health issues and mental health conditions that are um, appearing in, in childhood. By the age mm -hmm. of 14, 15, um, the vast majority of mental health conditions um, are there in youngsters. So if we can get to them from, from starting school um, and nursery, mm -hmm preventative strategies like the take five, like the glitter jar, like the resilient thinking, um, that's going to be brilliant. Okay, thank you. That's all our questions. I didn't know whether, you know, you had any sort of final comments, uh, each of you, and then I'll let everybody know what uh, what our next webinar is. Any final closing thoughts? From me, it's just reinforce what I've just said in terms of I can't, um, emphasize enough how important it is to we all have busy lives to find a time in your daily routine where you can take at least a few minutes whether it's morning afternoon before you go to bed when you get up whatever it is to do something for your mental health and that could be as simple as and i'm saying simple but it isn't easy i challenge people to try it look at yourself in a mirror make eye contact with yourself and give yourself a smile it sounds so easy we smile at other people all the time it releases all of the natural happy chemicals and all the rest of it it makes us feel good but we don't smile at ourselves 
And if you can take a split second on, on a morning or an evening to smile at yourself, that in itself is releasing lots of, of natural happy hormones that are flooding the system. So yeah, just find, find a time and do something, whatever works for you, however and whenever it works, but do something. Thanks, Sandra. Sue, so, I don't know, are there any sort of closing thoughts? Um, it's focusing on the, the positives, really, the positives of going back to school, the positives that have happened over the last few months, what they have achieved and what you have done, um, and making the most of the last few days that you've got before school starts and um, trying to have some fun in there as well. And like Sandra said, you know, laughter, um, smiling, these really are, are the best medicine. So, um, yeah, try and enjoy it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Sue has done a fantastic job of looking after all our slides today. So we'll just pop our final slides on um, with regards to uh, our webinar, our next webinar. All in our new corporate colours and style. Uh, so uh, next week, 4th of September, we've got Bernard back. We know we had a few technical difficulties when we tried to put this on the other week. Uh, we can plan for everything, but but not a bit of a storm and a downpour that takes out someone's broadband, uh, unfortunately. But fantastic that we'll be able to, we've been able to get this rearranged so quickly. It's at a slight, uh, slightly later time next week of two o'clock, so just uh, bear that in mind. We wanted to get it in as soon as we could, and that's uh, the time next Friday that we could get it in on. Uh, and Bernard will be covering the second part uh, of his sessions on resilience, uh, where he'll be looking at emotional control, about being decisive, uh, and thinking like a successful person. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one. Don't forget, you're going to need your piece of string uh, with your keys on the bottom, uh, whether you kept it from last time, uh, uh, you'll need that with you. Anthony will drop you out an email uh, to let you know what's to acquire, just remind people around that. Uh, but for now, um, thanks for joining us today. I hope you've got something valuable from it. I hope you've picked up some good tips and advice. Clearly, you all with parents and grandparents, we know our children best, and I hope they have a positive experience back into school, getting to see their friends again. Okay then, thank you.